Peace, how you doing? Um, today we're going to be talking about the Dennis the Menace effect and white male mass shooters in American history. Uh, so this past Sunday in Sutherland, Texas, uh, we had another mass shooting, right? And so that was Sunday the 5th of November. And you had a young white male, another young white male. Um, I believe his name was uh, Kevin Patrick, something of that nature. And he was clad in uh, a bulletproof vest. He had an assault rifle wearing all black. Uh, went into this Baptist church in Sutherland, Texas. Uh, killed 26 people including one family that had eight members there. And <clears throat> he also wounded over 20 people, right? Now, the thing is, America has a hard time trying to really rein in the truth behind these mass shootings. Uh, one thing that I think is a very good tool to use, Mother Jones, an award-winning uh editorial uh, news publication one of their contributors one of their authors he put together a compendium um, a database of all the mass shootings uh, and it detailed a lot of the pertinent details of these mass shootings in America from 1982 to this past shooting in Sutherland Texas of November 5th 2017 <clears throat> One thing that is blatantly obvious, completely evident, as we know, the traditional forensic profile or criminal profile of these mass shooters are young white males. The overwhelming majority, young white males, um, typically between the ages of uh, their early to mid-20s into their 40s, right? Now... You also have to look at what's happening nationally, compare that to the data that he published, and also think about this. Uh, out of those from 1982 to 2017, that's 35 years, out of those three and a half decades, only three women have been implicated as the perpetrator, as a shooter or accomplice, three women out of 35 years. That speaks volumes. Um, it says something about women. And I'm not going to go too in depth because I already did an a, a audio blog about that. But I believe that we have a lot to learn from women. Something about uh, coping strategies, problem solving strategies, looking at problems that confront them from different angles to arrive at solutions out of situations that maybe most men just chalk up and say, hey, I don't know how to solve this. So my only other solution is to uh, break out in violence and kill people. Now, moving along, the Dennis and Menace effect, the Dennis the Menace effect. Many people that grew up um, prior to the 19... 70s, you know, I forget which year the original TV sitcom aired. But Dennis the Menace has been out a long time. You know, first it was just a sitcom, you know, it had the actors and everything. And then um, in the 80s to, I believe, maybe the early 90s, you had the cartoon version of Dennis the Menace. And one of the things that you had to notice was hey, Dennis the Menace represents young white male privilege and that young white male privilege it morphs transforms and evolves it manifests into what we see right now these mass shootings and i'm going to tie it all in if you looked at dennis the menace the tv show and dennis the menace the cartoon you could not help but realize and see before your eyes that this young man, this young white male, young white boy, 
was always involved in some type of chicanery, some type of mischief. He was always causing mayhem. You know, there's melee. Um, there's just mass pandemonium wherever he went. People were, you know, when you hear his name, you know, you had this one elderly gentleman that uh, elderly gentleman. He was a character named Mr. Wilson. Uh, whenever Dennis would come, it was almost like a haunting, uh, menacing uh, introduction because he would always be like, Mr. Wilson. And, you know, Mr. Wilson, he would always cringe up in fear and terror, like, oh, Dennis, you know, like, because he knew what Dennis was capable of. He knew the capacity of the destruction of the carnage that. Dennis would reap on them the havoc that he would uh, instill on anybody in that community. Dennis would um, flatten tires, break windows, uh, unleash all the dogs in the neighborhood, uh, set things on fire. He would uh, he would conspire with his uh, other white male friend. I believe his name was Joey. He was supposed to be like kind of like a smart guy, and they would make laboratory stuff and uh things will blow up um you know do things like put too much detergent purposefully uh inside of a wash machine so that it would uh over flood and you know just anything that you could think of dennis was into and it was always causing trouble it was always malfunctioning it was always causing somebody problems inconveniencing them, putting them in places of discomfort and pain. Um, And that's what happened. And the thing is, here's the other thing. If you ever paid attention, what was one thing Dennis always carried with him? Okay. If you don't know, Dennis always walked around with a slingshot, a slingshot. Yes, a slingshot. A handheld device where you can put pebbles, rocks, marbles, and pull it. And Dennis would go around aiming that slingshot at any and everybody, any and everything, shooting it off like it was nothing, right? Now, that's symbolic to the gun that these young white males are always in possession of. And they shoot it off at anybody, shoot it off at anything, right? Now, here's the thing. Dennis was never properly punished. Dennis never faced any real punitive repercussions. Um, we think about punishment, you know. He, he, Dennis was the pioneer recipient of the timeout. You know, Dennis didn't get spanked. Um, when you think of what goes on in the community in real time today, um, if you are not a young white male and you try half the stuff that you saw Dennis doing, um, you could just think about what happened with Tamir Rice uh, with his toy gun. He got popped and killed by police officer in just a matter of seconds uh, from the passenger side of the police car um, for selling CDs. Alton Sterling was shot in the chest and killed, you know, uh, these type of things, the repercussions for the most trivial activity in society for blacks and others is met with the most severe, the most extreme, the most lethal, um, excessive force exerted on them um, by law enforcement police Dennis, you never saw, and I, know, I understand it's a sitcom, it's a cartoon, uh, but it's the thing, it's the messages that are conveyed and relayed into the psyche of those that are watching it. So when Dennis got in trouble, the only thing that ever happened to him was he would get a slap on the wrist, literally, literally a slap on the wrist from his mother. Um, she'd shake her finger in his face. You shouldn't do that, Dennis. Don't do that. That's 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 wrong. That's you shouldn't do that. Or she'll just grab him by his ear, his earlobe, and pull him away. 
or she may say, go to your room. That was it. So by the most minimal, the most minimal, the the least application of punishment, punitive recourse for egregious actions and irresponsible behavior, disrespectful behavior in society that Dennis the Menace would put his neighbors through, put his family through, he had the least amount of punishment. What's the message from there? That it's okay for me to do what I do because I'm not going to really, I can handle this punishment. This is light work for me. This is nothing for me. I know I'm not going to, I can deal with what they're going to dish out. And so that white male privilege affords them all the perks and the amenities and the luxuries and the benefits and the privileges to say, hey, when I get older, I'm going to step it up a level. It's no longer just me turning on a sprinkler and letting dogs out and breaking windows. No, I'm breaking real laws. Yeah, when I get into corporate America, I'm doing whatever I want to do um, from this corporate office. Um, you saw the young white male, I believe his name was Brock something, who raped a young white girl in the alleyway um, behind a dumpster. And you saw that uh, he got off. They let him off where he can just go around and do lectures on sexual assault. Excuse me, this man committed rape. He raped a young girl. And they said, well, he couldn't, we don't think that he could handle prison. Prison would be too rough for him. And it would ruin his educational and professional career. That's white male privilege right there. You understand? Um, this phenomena, how America engages in the coddling of young white males from birth all the way up into adulthood creates their own Frankenstein. And their Frankenstein then comes home when Frankenstein has matured into adulthood and ends up massacring the whole village because Frankenstein has never been taught no. Frankenstein has never been denied anything. Frankenstein has never had to follow rules, regulations, laws, policies, stipulations, okay? Frankenstein, a.k.a. Dennis the Menace, feels that he is impervious to law enforcement. He transcends the no, that the average African-American, the average Latino, the average, let's say, uh, any other ethnic group that's non-white uh, must subscribe to. And if not subscribe to, you face heavy punitive repercussions. OK, the most severest. And so now the cognitive dissonance sets in where when he gets older and gets out into society, and then is faced with certain things that no longer fit that coddling that he received when he was a young boy, a young teenager. It causes that cognitive dissonance and he does not know how to solve it because he's, it's always been solved for him or given to him. And then when people say, well, you a grown man now. You should be able to handle that. No, nah, we're not helping you. No, you can't do that. No. No. These bills are due. Girls tell you, no. You're, you're, they're all of a sudden, it's like, well, why, why not? Why, why can't I? What, what, what do you mean, no? What, no, I'll take it. If I can't have it, I'll destroy it. If I can't run it, then I'm going to wreck it. And this is what you see happening. And so they've, these Dennis the Menaces have traded in their slingshots for gunshots, for shotguns, for AR-15s. AK-47s, other high-powered assault weapons with uh, multiple rounds of ammunition and body armor. And they take their actions out on whomever they feel they want to direct it at. That's America. That's, that, that is America right there. And it's, and it's the fact that we won't call it terrorism because of the fact that if we were to call these mass shooters, terrorists, America will be forced to redirect all of the intelligence community, 
all of their black ops, all of their mercenaries, the Navy, all right, the Army, okay, the Marines, all their military expertise, they'd have to redirect it and turn it inward to their local suburban communities where they have the white picket fences and the Starbucks cafes where service comes with a smile, cream and extra splendor for their latte. The place where they walk their dogs in their yoga studios, they'd have to redirect all of that military attention and might um, on their very own young white males because the veneer, the facade of this patriot, patriotic young white male, the veil would have been lifted and nobody wants to see their child handle the way they handle terrorism abroad in the Middle East. They don't want to see that It'll tear a family apart. It will tear apart the American, the fabric of America right there to know that my child is on the same level as these terrorists in the Middle East, they claim. Now, why? You have to think about that. Well, yes, they're just as deadly. When you have young white males that are mowing down 26 people at a time, 20 people at a time, Las Vegas, 50 people at a time, you're just as lethal. Lives are just as just because a person may be from a different country and you think that it is it has to have a political agenda. Lives are still lost. The same amount of lives are still lost. The only difference is when you talk about a mass shooter versus a terrorist it's the level of expediency and the elevation of resources and military might that you use to address it. See, when it's a mass shooter, we try to find the reasons behind why he did it and background checks and seeing what we can do about mental health. Excuse me. When it's a terrorist, well, we have to figure out, we have to get in the war room we need to figure out how we're going to get platoons and brigades and occupy territory and space. Um, we have to make sure we set up geographical boundaries and monitoring and make sure that we take out these um, militants, these radicals, these insurgents, um, these combatants make sure we can take them out with extreme precision on sight we have to throw them in guantanamo bay see just imagine if the same way you handle these individuals overseas that you call terrorists imagine if the military came home and started rounding up billy and chad or just started picking them off with drones you see drones coming through all your uh, local suburbia, suburban neighborhoods, picking people off, dropping bombs on people's homes, um, having black ops at the door, snipers on the roof, taking out young white males. They, America's not going to have that. So they said, you know what? No, we need to think of a, 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 another way to explain this away because we can't have uh, the military uh, doing this. But it's the same effect. You don't want the military doing that to young white males. But the fact is, the fact is, young white males are exacting and exerting and imposing and inflicting the same amount of damage. When you have them dropping bodies, 26 people at a time, 20 people at a time, the Colorado theater shooting kills so many people at one time. <coughs> Columbine. Kill so many people at one time. Las Vegas kill so many people at one time. Timothy McVeigh kill so many people at one time. Wade Michael Page with the Sikh Temple shooting kill so many people at one time. All right, it gets real. It gets real. They're killing. You can't devalue human life 
just because you have a military political global agenda you have to deal with the same threat we're dealing with the threat of the loss of lives at massive amounts of lives at one time so you have to uh, find ways to do that and you can't be inconsistent you have to be consistent with that otherwise you're allowing this to happen again and again and as and people keep wondering why we keep having this again and again these sandy hooks you know again and again because once again just like Dennis and his parents we slap them on the wrist we drag them out by the ear we wag our finger in their face we no 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 we time out i guarantee you take these guys waterboard them stick them in guantanamo bay or handle them like you would any of these other terrorists whether it's by drone killings black ops mercenaries um any of these other operations you will see that come having raids on these houses all these compounds that you have, all these family compounds that have massive arsenals of guns, you start sending them out there and conducting raids on them, you'll see that change overnight. But America won't do that. So that's Dennis the Menace effect. America's Frankenstein. Mass shooting. And it's the purge because that's exactly what these young white male mass shooters are doing they are purging society scores at a time and the thing the icing on the cake the icing on the cake that makes it a reality when we talk about white male privilege that allows that permits these things to happen over and over again is highlighted by the way they handled this man's past. This man had a dishonorable discharge. He was kicked out of the military. He threatened military officers, argued with military officers. This man had a mental, he was, he, he had mental health issues. I believe he actually was institutionalized for a minute. He broke out of a mental institution. He has a history of um, child abuse, spousal abuse. Um, he has been arrested, um, had issues with guns, and I believe uh, had uh, disagreements, uh, fights with police officers. So, and, 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 and even animal abuse, you know, you may write that off, but then at the same time, what did Michael Vick go to jail for? So, um, none of that was ever re reported or recorded in, uh, his criminal past. And you have to ask yourself why? Why, why was that not um, added to his dossier? None of that. You, you got kicked out of the military. You have mental issues. You have beat children. You have beaten spouses. You have uh, been arrested and uh, had fights with uh, police. None of that is documented. That's just kind of somehow erased. It's omitted. It's deleted. It's not put it on there and so then he's free to purchase any firearm and weapon that he wants privilege privilege whereas most black people when they get out of jail or they get something on their record it follows them around forever it's a scarlet letter they can't get jobs okay housing Okay, voting, all right, firearms, all right. That sticks with us like an unpaid bill sticks with us. Yet, it's as if this record that he has, this litany of things, litany of violations and crimes, is as if this man was as clean as a whistle. 
Anyway, I'm out. The Dennis and Menace effect. America's Frankenstein coming home to cause terror.